New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. It's Ebro in the Morning. You got the beautiful Laura Styles. You got Rosenberg in here. Roxanne Shantae, the yeah. legend, in the building. Hey, Have a nice day. Make sure y'all check Roxanne, Roxanne on Netflix. Yes. All right, so let's get right into it. Um, it says based on a true story. Yes. So what in Roxanne, Roxanne is fact and what was added in for entertainment value? And I know there's a lot of, thing, a lot of things in there that we'll, well, we'll walk it, through, but what's fact? Well, it's it's all fact. If you okay. you know, if you're talking about the most crucial points of the movie or the parts that you feel are like, oh my goodness, that can't be real. You know, those are real Roxanne and Shantae facts. That's just how Roxanne and Shantae's life was. Um, so you was going to wash the clothes, yes. and Marley Marl yelled out the window, "Come, j- Roxanne, you still rapping?" Absolutely, absolutely. And what we did was we made it so that people would see how organic the movie is. Yeah, we took old photos and old videos and old yep. interviews yep. that confirmed it. Yep. So if you notice that that same incident, right. we took that and had it where Marley Mall said it out of his own mouth. Like, listen, this is what happened and even conducted that same interview. So we wanted to do that. It wasn't a way of like proving this is true or that's true, but it was just a way of showing the true organic time of the movie because right. so many people make movies and they add so much to it or they want to always make it seem like everything is about how much money they're making and how fancy this is and everything is about the club life and you don't really get to see the struggle before, after, and during the club life. In the movie, um, there's a lot, I, and I want to get to, because obviously there's the rap talk and you being the first female mainstream mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hip hop artist, right? Mm-hmm. Like you were the one first to have a hit song on the radio. Um, so there's a lot made of that, but I think more interesting in the film and something I, I know because I know you still work with young girls. I know you still work in the community. You work with young people and education. Yes, yes I do. Um, a lot of the film also deals with the fact that you, at a young age, 14, 15 years old, with a mother who was drinking a lot, mm-hmm. right? You got you made sure that in this film the disappointment of men in your life. The, the the boyfriend your mom had, I think his name was Dave. Yes. The day y'all was supposed to move out the projects. Yes. And he took off with the $20,000. Yes. And yeah, you and your story. sisters are sitting there yes. just kind of like. Yes. And what it was, was we wanted the movie to reflect how it is when as a parent, and especially as like maybe a single mom or as a parent, period, what happens is you don't, the worst thing in the world, the worst feeling for you is is letting your children down. But then the feeling when you let someone else let your children down, mm. it right. even gets to you. Where, and this is like that dream, that dream of leaving the projects, that dream of going on, that dream of having more. And when you get ready to move, what is the first thing you do? You start selling all your old stuff mm-hmm. because you're going to take new memories and new of things. Course. So my mom had did all of that. So we were down to boxes. So it was like, it wasn't just like, okay, look, we're not moving. Everybody go make up your beds. You know, we had actually got rid of furniture. So it was like having to start all over again from the same spot. And that had to be, you know, that was really hard for my mom. And I watched her, you know, I watched her go through this. I watched, you know, we talk about depression. We talk about alcoholism. We talk about different things that, you know, are taboo, that you don't cover, that you don't talk about. So even in the process of doing the movie, when I was talking to my mom about it, and she was like, look, tell the story. It needs to be told Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of women out here right now that are not bouncing back Mm -hmm. because they feel like they're the only one this happened to. Well, and also, too, there was... Uh, the lady, Miss Peggy was your mom, right? That's right, and we the call lady, her Miss Peggy all the time. Right, the yes. lady sitting across, so so the scene is set, uh, Dave was the boyfriend, doesn't show up. Right. So it's her and her three sisters standing in the hallway just kind of like watching their mom basically cry to a, a neighbor. Yes. And have drinks and start drinking. And the neighbor says to your mom, go ahead and let it out. But your mom instead tries to act tough. Yes. Right, and then turns and kind of starts lashing out on you in the hallway. And yes. That, was that a real scene where, like, you watched your mom become hardened and, yes. like... Like, you remember that specifically playing out that way? Yes. I remember I remember the day that it took place. You know, I remember the exact drink that it was. And, yeah, absolutely. You know, I do. I remember, you know, I remember the Majaska bottle sitting there. Like, not that I have anything against the Majaska. I'm just saying the Majaska bottle sitting there. 
And my mom wasn't a drinker. You know, my mom was one of those moms that, you know, she cooked, she cleaned, she worked. You know, we going to get out of here. She hustled hard. Like, she sold the beads. Like, I think everybody in the projects might have purchased beads from my mom because she sold those beads. That in you the doorway. Bust, the doorway yeah. beads that you yeah. bust through. She had the good African ones that didn't pop really <laughs> quick. You know, and she sold the candle holders. And we sold, you know, she sold boxes of paper. She said she cleaned toilets. Yeah, she, she was did, wiping yeah, ass. Yeah, she, she was she taking did everything. care of you know, she worked in a She worked in a hotel. She worked as a domesticated worker. You know, even one of the ladies that she worked for was the reason why I was able to go to school in Woodside um, projects because she used this lady's address and so allowed me to, to, go, to so I go to a better school system. So, you know, she she came up here from Alabama, hard work and like, look, and this is what we're going to do. So when you have these southern roots, your your goal is to own your own home and to do these own things and do your own thing with it. And so when this happened, you know, I watched it and I watched it start from just one drink. And I knew that this was not my mom. This was not Miss Peggy. This was not the moment. But I also knew that she was always going to come out of it. So for me, the hustle was temporary. The struggle was temporary. The things I had to do for my sisters was temporary. You know, I just didn't know that I was going to get into hip hop and I was never going to be able to turn back. Did you, um, because in the film, after you get beat up by your baby's father really yes. bad, right? And you're in the hospital. Yes. Um, the scene of you and your mother in that hospital with your sisters there and you're 16 years old. Yes. Right. Um, and you say to your mom, your mom says to you, what happened to you, Roxanne? Right. Like mm -hmm. you've been beat up a couple of times. Mm -hmm. You your jaw been broken at this point in the film. Right. Um, and you say to your mom, I just wanted to be a kid, mom. And you left me. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that was another layer of disappointment. And I'm jumping ahead for people who haven't seen it. But right. Can you tell tell me about that relationship with you and your mom at that point? And well, what I think it was is the fact that my mom felt like, okay, I had already started this this fantastic. First, I started off as a as a booster, so I was already stealing clothes, right? So I was already getting money, so I was doing that. So I was already popular in that aspect, and then becoming a battle rapper and making money from winning battles all over the city. I was making money in that aspect. Then I become Roxanne, Roxanne. So now they're feeling like, okay, you're making money hand over fist in that aspect. My mom was feeling like, you know what? I've told you, like, how could you let this happen to you mm. when I've already instilled in you how men can be, what takes place with men? Like, I've raised you to be stronger than this. But like, you wanted love to, from a man. You wanted that. You know, that. It, it's, it's daddy issues. It, yeah. it, you know, a lot of women suffer from them, but they don't want to say that. A lot of women go through that, but they don't want to come out and be open with it. The first thing they'll say is like, you, you'll find a woman, like for instance, men will make a mockery of a woman who they feel is too clingy. They'll be like, oh my God, like she just on me all the time. She mm -hmm. don't want to let go. She's always asking me this. She always wants to be, you know, and it could be a fact of her having daddy issues and having separation anxiety. When you leave, she just wants to know where you at to make sure you coming back. Yeah. Right, because she's right. been disappointed because, because so much. Because she's been yeah. disappointed so much. So it's not the fact that she's on you because nine times out of ten, she can get another man. That is not hard for her to do. But she wants to make it right with each man that she's with because she doesn't want to keep going through the same separation, you know, the same disappointment. What am I doing wrong? What is it about me? Okay, my behaviors will change. I will act better. Because as children, when a parent leaves the home, we take the assumption that it was our behavior that contributed to them leaving. Of course. That if we would have been quieter, mm -hmm. if we would have played better. Mommy and daddy would still be yeah, together. they would right. still be together. So there's a certain amount of guilt that you take on with that. And when you're the eldest child and you're the first child, you feel like you were responsible for making sure everybody was in line so if you would have done your job better Everything. then the household would have been complete so my mom saying like you know I've taught you from the very beginning Shante that you need to be this way you know and it wasn't about the financial independence but what she could not teach me the thing that she was unable to show me was what do I do when I want to be loved by him what do I do when I want that yeah because now she's a grown woman she's already experienced pain she feels that she's already you know, transmitted that same pain onto us. So she can't teach me that. So I'm trying to learn that on my own, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. I'm trying to learn that and it doesn't seem to be able to work. Like I don't have an understanding of this. And when you have no positive male figures, and this goes for male and female children, when you have no positive male roles, you are not exactly sure of what to do. You don't know what is right. So if someone tells you, I hit you because I love you, and you know that, 
you discipline your children because you love them, you don't know if this is right or wrong. No, in fact, it's more likely that you think it's right. Because uh, you start to think like, okay, you know what? Maybe I was talking to you. And it's being told to you. Yeah. And, and it's being and, and literally right. said to you. No, I love you. And that's why I'm showing. Here's my question. When you speak, it's obvious, it's so clear that you have a, a history that lends itself to being able to be helpful when it comes to young people. Yes. Um, so can you catch people up? on what you have what your career has been <laughs> as an adult because we really only know you as a kid right. what what, ha what has your adult career been Shante? well i have a nonprofit organization which is called mind over matter which we now operate out of newark new jersey where i take um young women from and i don't want to say just ne necessarily women i want to say young girls from the ninth grade to the 12th grade and i follow them throughout high school to make sure that they graduate. I stay with them the whole time. Personal issues, I go home with them. You know, make I talk sure to their parents. Make sure they show up to class. Exactly. Because Shantae to, wasn't showing up to class, Exactly, and even, and even to the point of where um, a lot of the young girls in my program happen to be in foster care, so I became a CASA, which is a court-appointed special advocate for children who are in foster care. So it allowed me to be able to go in court and speak for these young girls and say, okay, listen, this is what's going on at home. This is what's going on at school because a lot of them I have also in class. But then we've also expanded, and we're in Chicago um, with the Alternative Education Research Institute where what we do is we go into the urban areas and the areas where Chirac and the areas where people don't want to go or people feel like it's very dangerous, you know, um, we go to the south side and Inglewood and we want to make sure that the right programs are put in place because they send out these blanket programs which are not successful because these communities need more than that. We can't teach them how to knit and bring in a knitting program and spend $100,000 on teaching them how to knit when we need an anti-gang and anti-violence program here. They don't need to know how to knit sweaters. That's not what they need. Or they don't need to learn how to make shoes or we're going to teach them how to paint to music. Like, we don't need, they don't need that here. Mm -hmm. So in order Nor to... Are they likely interested. Exactly. Right. But the funding will go to a program like that. So instead, what we do is we go in and we make sure that they understand this is what's done and everything has to go back to research. Because if you don't present the proper research, because you can no beg money. all you want to on paper, but they need to see numbers. They need to see research. They need to know that you were there. They need to know that you heard gunshots. They need to know that you seen a trauma unit. They need to know that you sat down with these kids. And so, and so that's pretty much what. So basically, you've been doing goes. awesome stuff. Thank you. Really special <laughs> stuff you, in the community. You moved to Jersey early, right? Like that's in the story on on the show. You moved to Jersey when you were 15, 16 years old, because that was where you was with that older dude. Right, I moved to, I had moved to Newark, New Jersey, but then I had also left Newark, New Jersey, but then I came back. So I have now came back to Newark, New Jersey now, and I live in um, in uh, the South Ward, which is, they call it, they say that it is a high crime area, but that is not true. What we're actually doing is it is a high change area. And because of that, it brings a lot of attention to that area. You know, I've came up with my own term, which I've called reentrification. See, people call it gentrification when they think they come in, they take over neighborhoods and things like that. But reentrification means you leave, you go make a lot of money, you move back into the mm. hood, you show them some success, you let these children see a positive person living on the corner from them where the kids can walk past my house every day and say, oh, yeah, you know what? That's where Miss Shante, like, some of my students from my high school actually live a block away from me. Mm -hmm. And so what they'll do is in the mornings, they'll be like, oh, yeah, no, Miss Shante lives there. Like, yo, do you know anybody with a million dollars? They'll be like, yeah, Miss Shante got a million dollars. She's right there. And now it's like, Miss Shante got a movie and she lives right there. And they need to see this. They need to know that it's more than just on television. They need to know that it's more than out of reach or everybody doesn't get their money and run from the hood. Some of us make money, run back to the hood and try to fix it. There was a really powerful scene, and I remember because I remember just as a hip hop nerd looking at photos, mm -hmm. the photo that was taken, the portrait of you, that you know you tell the story again in a, in the film where the photographer is telling you to smile. Yes, and you couldn't smile because you had a broken jaw. Yes, and it was so crazy for me because I remember looking at this photo and and seeing this photo and you know on the internet, mm -hmm. I I was I couldn't believe it because I you know at the time. I just couldn't believe how, that your jaw was actually broken at the time and how hard it was for you. How was it just having to retell the story and the truth behind all that? Well, that photo happens to be a very popular photo because for some reason, um, people, and, and it just might be the law of the universe, but people just tend to gravitate towards that photo because they were like, wow, you know, your cheeks look so big, mm -hmm. you know, and compared to like we saw your week before this photo and now look, you know, like you're, you're putting on weight. You know, but nothing else is getting bigger, but your face is bigger. So the picture itself looks like a different view of Roxanne Shantae. 
So I would see the picture so often. And, and there was no way to take it out of circulation. Yeah. So I decided to explain the reason why the photo looked the way it did. So then it explains the reason why the cheeks are so big, under the eye is so puffy, the mouth is so small. And you know, like, you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't even really look like Roxanne Shante. You know, like we know it's her, but you know, what else is it about this picture that we just can't seem to put our finger on? So when I explained it, then all of a sudden, everyone was able to look at the picture for now for what they see in it. They're like, my God, you can see it. Like, how could nobody else see it? How could nobody else say anything? And I think, you know, a lot of times because he was very popular, because, you know, he was the Coke man, because he was the one who they would see after the parties, they just kind of allowed it to just go on. But being the mother of a 14 year old, being the mother of a 15 year old, that's when I really got angered by it. I think mm -hmm. that's when I really felt the hurt. Because having how my, could my community allow this to could, happen exactly. to me? Exactly, right. and so that also made me understand that I needed to be that superhero, that rescuer for another little girl who might be going through that. Because I would have loved to have had a Miss Shante. Because if I see somebody arguing in the street, I'm quick to be like, "Yo, hold on, you okay?" Right you now, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. 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 and, and I wish like somebody would have been that for me. But let's be honest, Miss Peggy. Yes. In the scene, in the movie, you're, you're sitting there next to the guy you're dating. I don't. In the movie, what is the age difference? You're 15. He's how old? At that time, maybe 29, 30. Wow. He was twice your age. Yes. And so you, just that alone, you think well, so her, like, mother, Yo, you're... her mother's like, you know, who she... the who the like straight up, yeah, who the fuck are pervert. you? Who's this fucking dude? You're fucking disgusting. You fucking him? Like in the scene, her mom is like, Yo, you fucking this dude? He goes to run off like, Shantae, you're not ready for this real shit. Your mom's crazy, whatever. I'm leaving. Shantae runs after him like, I don't want to leave you. He pushes her like, yo, get out of here, little kid. And she's like, nah, I love you. I want to be with you. Basically was the exactly. body language. Exactly. And it, and it was. Because, again, there's those daddy issues. There's that separation. There's that feeling of, no, don't leave. Like, no, don't go. Because I don't want to go through meeting another man, going through this all over again. Like, you know, sometimes we will accept and deal with the devils we have rather than wait for the devil mm -hmm, we don't, mm -hmm. you know? That's a lot of times, like even a lot of men are in situations with women now that are the worst. They don't want to be with her no more, but then they feel like, you know what, if I leave her, then I got to wind up being with this one. At least I know this one here and got her credit together. I know what I'm dealing with. Exactly, so, you know, and so I just wasn't, and then still being a child. Like, like no one understood it, the fact, still being a child. Now, yes, should I have listened to my mom? Absolutely. How many times do we not listen to our mothers? What could your mother have done for the parents right now that have a 15-year-old that might be dealing? Because there's that fine, like, what? Your mom was in a situation like, yo, you want to be in the street? Go ahead and find out the hard way then. Right. Like your mom in the movie locked the doors at nine o'clock and yes, your key did. didn't work no more. That's right. If you wasn't in the house at nine o'clock, you wasn't getting in the house. Right, right, right. But my household wasn't the only household like that. My that was not that's not a rare story. That is how most yeah. moms I mean, yeah. you know, most moms tell yes. you, listen, if you're not in here by this time, or either they let you in and you would go through the whole, you know, beating, spanking, get messed up, embarrassed, they come outside looking for you and everything else. But I had already been so in the streets so much that my mom couldn't leave the little ones in the house to come outside to come look for me. So it was like, okay, you know what? I'm locking my doors at a certain time. And that was considered, and that is still a very respectful household in the hood when somebody's mom said, yo, listen, you can't come in here and run in and out of here all night long. We thought it was fun to go to whoever's house where their moms let them come in midnight. You can hang out their mm -hmm. house, everybody in their house laughing, drinking, smoking. That wasn't going on in my household. But what would your mom, what could your mom have done in that moment? Like there was, you know, if if I had to say what would be the answer for any parent today and what they could do is you now have a movie like Roxanne, Roxanne, where your girls can sit down, look at the movie and realize that you're not the only one saying this. You're not the only one being, you know, corny or mom, you know what I'm saying? You just don't understand what's going on and that, for them to sit down and say, okay, well, listen, you know what, throw this on your phone and look at it. And, and see the story, you know, see the situation. Because every little girl who has, or every teenage girl who has started to watch the movie, they go into it reluctantly, like, oh, it's gonna be some old school stuff. And then once they get into it, they're like, oh, this is me. You know, and, and this is what happened. But isn't there also, uh, a, I guess, a parenting style, right? Because we talk a lot on this show about parenting is not a one size fits all thing. No, it's not. Thing, right? You as a parent have to know what 
your child responds to and yes. what they need. Like you have to pay attention. But you also have to know your child. But that's and what if, I'm saying. And, if, and yeah. if, if their video games are raising them and if they're in the house without contact with you. You already off base. And you, you, how? You don't even know. But them. I feel like in the movie, if your mom wouldn't have been so unappreciative because there's also a scene where you're like, Mom, I'm just trying to get this money. You need money. Mm -hmm. We need money. Right. And your mom wasn't even appreciative of what you was trying to do for the household. But what she was also saying is the fact that I don't care about the money. I need you to go to school. I want something better for you than this. Right. You're going to get caught up in these streets, Shantae, and you're not going to get out of them. And she did not lie. She did not lie. Every day, I wish I would have listened to her and and been more attentive to the things she was saying and the lessons she was bringing me before I had to go out here and learn them for myself. When she said, he's too old for you, I wish I would have stayed in the restaurant and, and not have went and traveled any further and could stop it right then and there because then, you know, we may not have had Roxanne Shante, the known rapper, we might have had Roxanne Shante, the attorney sitting in front of you, or Roxanne Shante, the judge sitting in front of you. Are you, you know, still that in a, type of thing? Are you still in a place where you want Rock? There's a you want Roxanne Shante gone. Like there's a in the film, it you wanted to cut your ponytail off. You wanted to be a different person. You wanted Roxanne Shante gone. You did not want to be her. You almost hated her. I, I think you guys were I, yeah, I, framing it absolutely. in the film. Do you absolutely. still feel that way? It's not a fact of hurting anything about myself. It was a fact of hating the things that I allowed myself to go through as Roxanne Shante. See, the, the ponytail gave me unique features, as in I wasn't just the regular brown skin girl from, you know, the projects. I was the girl with the braces and the ponytail. Mm -hmm. So it became very identifying when people would see that. Recently, um, I was talking with my husband and we were talking about going to the premieres and going to the premieres. It was suggested that, you know what, Shante, you know, wear your hair back wear in the, the pony ponytail. Wear it in the ponytail. So, you know, it had been years since I had brushed my hair down and wore it in a ponytail. And I actually found it so difficult and was so uncomfortable with it. Like, I like my hair in a bun. Yeah. I wear it in a bun. I brush it up. I like it in a bun. That's just me. Um, but wearing it in a ponytail, I found it so difficult because then it was like all of the pictures and the red carpets and so the premieres. Still, they're still and pain. So they're still pain. Yeah, so there's still a lot there that made me say, like, the other day when we were getting ready to go back to Chicago and I go back into my regular Roxanne Shante life, which is still quite above average and I'm very happy with it and I love it but going back into my regular Roxanne Shantae life I could not wait to brush my hair back up and put it into a bun it's wow. almost like it was almost like a costume mm. or almost like a transformation that you go through mentally in order to be what everyone else wants you to be right. when you say no I want to be who I am and what I am that's why when I see these young ladies change the color of their hair change their hairdos change their hairstyles decide that they're no longer going to wear this or wear that or they want to be different I applaud that because I understand when you say okay look I'm separating from this I need to be me and being me makes me a lot stronger and can actually make me a more positive figure in whatever it is I do as opposed to running with the masses. So, yeah, I had difficulty wearing the ponytail just like I was last like. Last oh. week. Yeah, last <laughs> week. And I mean, and I was constantly and everyone was like, it looks fine. But I was constantly brushing it, constantly brushing it. And I'm like, why am I brushing my, yeah. my shit? It's all right. Like, like I'm looking at it and I see that it's like there was not a hair out of place. But for some reason, I was just having a hard time with it, and I couldn't wait to get back in my bun. Are you happy with the female rappers of today? Actually, I am. The reason why I am happy with the female rappers today is because I see that they are controlling as far as their business goes, as far as what they present out to us and what we see. We see them having a voice. They are not quieted down. I'm sure that they're involved in every aspect of their business. If you're not, there is no excuse with, with cell phones, iPhones, smartphones, all this information at your fingertips. There is no way that you should be getting a bad deal. You should not know about this. You should have no knowledge about that. There should be no rapper right now getting a bad deal not when this type of information is available at your fingertips see for us there was no ex there was there was that excuse we didn't have the information right, right no right. one told us you know they would tell us like i got into the business at the time when they said it was going to expire they was like look this right, got an expiration fad, date yeah. yeah this is a fad you only got 10 years of this you know and you're right now you're in the fourth year so you're six more years of this so listen sell us your publishing sell us your writers because it's not going to be worth nothing you know so you might as well get all you can get from it now like that's what you know we were told get all you can get now and coming from the hood you want to get all you can get people say well why wouldn't you guys save for a rainy day <laughs> 
The reason, let me tell you something. Save for a rainy day, it's been raining on us our entire lives. Mm. All we want is fancy umbrellas. We don't know anything about wanting to save for a rainy day. All we want to make sure is we got a fly raincoat because it's been clouds over us our entire life. So yeah. we're not saving for a rainy day. Every day is a rainy day. So we spend our money like that. Not only that, a lot of us didn't even realize, think that we were going to live past a certain right. age. Yeah. When you come into the streets and you're in the streets, I'm okay, I started in the streets when I was 13. They figured, okay, well, you know what? If she goes into the street life, which is a little different, you know, that's like prostitution, things like mm -hmm. that. So if she goes into the street life, she's 13, she might be dead by the time she's 16. Okay, so if you start the hustle and you're, you go into the hustle game and you're about 14, they'll say, okay, well, you know what? By the time she's 18, she'll be dead or she'll be in jail for a very long time. So either way, if you're making money, you're like, well, who am I going to leave it to? What I'm gonna do, I might as well just spend it as I get it. So people would spend it as they as they got it. Wow. Did you get paid from Nicki Minaj sampling your voice? Does that money go to you? Do I get crazy? Everyone that this is the this is the bonus for for Roxy and Shantae now. Everyone who samples my voice now, I receive royalties and money from it. The bonus for me is the fact that even though I didn't receive royalties then. Each time an artist goes platinum now, Roxy and Shantae continues to go platinum. That is the reason why Roxy and Shantae no longer seeks to make records or doesn't feel mm. like she needs to be in the hip hop industry. That's why I embrace being from the 80s because the 80s is still making me so much money yeah. when you are sampled by greats. You know, J. Cole's, the Kendrick Lamar's, the Nicki yeah. Minaj's, the Black Eyed Peas, the Janet Jackson's. You know, so as they continue to go platinum, so do I. So with that being said, like Amazing. you know, yeah, like yeah, thank you, yeah. thank you, yeah. So I, so I enjoy that. So when they see me and I drive a regular hoopty and I'm in the hood and you know, and that's another reason. That's another thing too. What I try to instill in the younger generation is it's not about all these name brands. If you make your name a brand, the name brands will send them to you for free. So the catch is to build yourself up to be wanted so much that you don't have to worry about like they were sending me clothes left and right. Like listen here, you know, we want you to wear this. We want you here. I'm like, oh. Okay, good. You know, and you don't have to worry about the pressures of wanting to do these things. So the kids will see me. I'm driving my hoops. They get in the car. They're like, "What is that?" I'm like, "That's a tape deck." It's like, <laughs> what, do you, "What do you put in? What do you put in that?" I was like, "Oh, dig in the arm side of there and find a yeah, tape, and I'll yeah. show you what you do." And they're like. Ew, that's what that does. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. I'm guessing you got to have many moments over the years where you were doing your other job, living your other life, and in casual conversation, you just got to know people. And they're like, so what did you do? Blah, blah, blah. And you're like, well, I'm Roxanne Shantae. And people were like, what? Like, did that ever happen? They do. They do. And then if, I, if we sit there and we talk about certain things that I may have contributed to, in hip hop history, it's almost like sitting there and being Forrest Gump at the bus stop. It's like, it's like, it's like life they're like, how like, many things do you do, Shantae? Yeah, exactly. It's like life is like a box of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> like, Yo, check out Roxanne. Roxanne on Netflix. It was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Thank you. And, thank and you. congratulations. Thank you. Yes, congratulations. Um, and also shout to uh, Ralph McDaniels, who I know played a part in. Absolutely, absolutely. And Pharrell and, and Forrest and Whitaker, Whitaker and, and, and Mimi Valdez, Valdez and, and, and Nina Bon Jovi. Yes, yes. Yes, because without Mimi and Nina, this project would have never happened. Wow. Never happened. And that needs to be said all the time. It would have never happened. And I love them. Thank you so much. Well, Roxanne Shantae, ladies and gentlemen.